All right, let's start. It's our keynote speaker, and it's really an honor for me to introduce you to Rosemary Garland Thompson. She's a professor emerita of English and bioethics at the Emory University and is a visiting professor of healthcare ethics at the UCLA. Rosemary is one of the founding mothers of disability studies in literary and cultural studies in the US and a senior advisor and fellow of the Hastings Center, where, she, where she's also chief project advisor for the arts of flourishing conversations on disability and technology. Her book, Extraordinary Bodies, already published in 97, eh? uh, and another one, Staring, How We Look, published in 2009, are still both highly relevant. I'm currently rereading them with my students in Amsterdam, and for them, it's again the first time they encounter something like disability, eh? and um, encountering something that disability matters in how we look at representations and how representation matters in how we look at disability or conceptualize disability. It's a scholarship that delves into disability and the intersection of disability, feminism, literature and culture, and it emphasizes the importance of critically analyzing representations of disability and challenging the traditional norms and prejudices associated with it. And I also want to um, mention another important text by Rosemary, namely her inaugural entry in the New York Times called Becoming Disabled, which was the start of a weekly and very rich series on disability and identity. And in her essay, Becoming Disabled, she encourages readers to rethink the concept of disability and challenges the ableist assumptions that often underlie public discussions of disability. It also gives you a glimpse of the US disability studies uh, history, something that is not present in Europe. Eh? Uh, as we know, there is not only very uh, less research on the history of disability and activism, it's even almost not documented here. It's also not yet present or institutionalized in the curriculum in universities. Disability studies, then I mean. Those essays of the New York Times are also now collected in a book titled About Us, Essays from Disability Series. Later on, Rosemary shifted from literary and cultural analysis towards the field of bioethics and what is also now called medical humanities. She developed and is still developing a disability bioethics, which is something very different from bioethics on disability. One of her seminal articles on that topic is Disability Bioethics from Theory to Practice, published in 2020, where she argues that bioethics needs to be more inclusive and responsive to the experiences and perspectives of disabled people, an argument which of that has been taken up and worked through by many of us in the neurogenetic research projects. I met Rosemary for an interview on feminism and disability more than three years ago. And that was also the moment that Christine, Rosemary and I were looking to work together to organize a workshop on disability bioethics. But of course, the pandemic came and um, the workshop was postponed endlessly because we really wanted to do something live. Um, so and now we are already at the closing conference of the New York Genetics Project. But nonetheless, we are very happy she could finally come and join us to give a talk on art and culture in disability bioethics. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Lenny. I will make sure that we have a, what I call, robust auditory environment for all. Um, Lenny, thank you for that generous introduction. And Christine, thank you for the invitation here. It's been such a pleasure to uh, get to know some of the projects. Uh, I wish I had had the opportunity to um, attend and participate more fully, but I had a conflict. 
uh, with another. It's the season, you know, another conference. But I'm delighted to be here. And of course, the ending of anything is also the beginning of something else. So I would invite us uh, all to think about ways that we can make things together uh, in the interesting and vibrant uh, collection of projects uh, and research and scholarship and knowledge that have been gathered here together. So I'm really honored to have been included on the edges of this and I hope for more with all of you. So this presentation, um, had I been able to work on it more today might have been uh, more sophisticated, let's say, than it is. It's very basic, disability in art and culture. And in some ways, it's a, uh, a, a report on what we might call um, cultural critical disability studies. Um, there's little inflection of the work that Lenny mentioned that I have been doing in what uh, we call disability bioethics. But I would be very interested in talking more about that um, and to hear your thoughts about uh, how the knowledge and the culture and the perspectives that would be expressed in what I'm presenting to you in a few moments might be knitted into uh, bioethics projects, especially genetic projects, and of course now the uh, work, the cultural work, if you will, of epigenetics. Um, so in that sense, this is the end, but I hope it's the beginning of many more conversations. So I will begin uh, where I almost always begin, and that is with uh, one of the fundamental claims of disability studies, critical disability studies, critical disability cultural studies. There's a pylon of words uh, as the field develops, and that is the idea that disability is everywhere once you know how to look for it. So together uh, we can look for disability in art and culture together here today. So I want to begin with a few definitions that I myself have developed. And about this PowerPoint, um, I hope that the organizers can make it available as a PDF, a kind of version of this presentation, and that PDF could be then made available for anyone who wants to revisit the images or the language or the definitions that I've offered here. So that's a technological task that somebody can undertake. Emma says yes. Anyway, so some definitions uh, that are my own of what is disability. So first, the human variations that we think of as disabilities, that's a rather awkward way to defamiliarize uh, the pathological versions of disability that uh, medical science has given us. So the human variations we think of as disabilities are part of the human condition that occur in every life and family and are a theme in all art and culture. And I'm showing a number of images. All of these images uh, will have uh, citations. So if you want to go back and look at some of these images, if visual imagery is a good way for you to absorb ideas, I will not describe these images, but they are here for you um, if they are uh, beneficial for you. So they illustrate or put forward the same point that the text in this presentation makes. So that's one definition. Another is the lived experiences of disability. 
and lived experiences is important here. Give people and communities opportunities for expression, creativity, resourcefulness, relationships, and flourishing, which is an important word drawn from philosophy. And philosophy, of course, is one of the disciplinary components of bioethics. So this is an opportunity for us to have more conversations together about disability bioethics. Another definition. Disability is a set of stories, narratives, that we receive and we remake about human variations that scientific medicine considers as disability, disease, illness, and body-mind differences. So I'm offering you here some vocabulary, and I'm focusing on the narrative aspect and we can talk more about this, of disability. Uh, we'll, we can talk more about this. And of course, I'm showing here uh, Van Gogh, who is um, from your general area and is one of the um, leaders of representations of disability in art and culture. So if disability is everywhere, once we know how to find it, uh, how might we find disability and where might we find it? So we find disability, of course, in literature, in dance, in art and design. These are the genres of uh, narrative, the narrative genres or the cultural narratives uh, where uh, I'm going to take you through where we might be able to find disability. And as Lenny suggested, I am a literature teacher. So I work primarily exclusively in narratives uh, of a variety of different forms. So that will be the emphasis here. So disability, I want to emphasize here, crosses all genre, media, time periods, aesthetic themes, and cultures. I want in my own work to universalize disability, to bring it from what is understood as a pathological situation, a pathological understanding more broadly into culture. So some examples from literature and the performing arts. <clears throat> so the founding narrative of Western culture, arguably, is of course the story of Oedipus the King. And I'm showing an image here of a book cover of Sophocles' Oedipus the King, and also uh, a marvelous photograph from 1896, so this is early in the history of photography, of a, a, a performer, and I don't know who this performer is, the name is here, but uh, playing the part of Oedipus. And I want to point out that the story of Oedipus, of course, is bookended. That is to say, it begins and it ends with disability, the beginning of uh, the story of Oedipus, of course, is Oedipus's damaged foot, which is, launches the story of uh, how he, of course, eventually determines his fate and learns his ancestry. Um, and of course, it's the discovery of the meaning of this damaged foot. And that, of course, at the end of the story of Oedipus the King, we have disability as well. And this is what we're seeing here, or what I'm showing you in this uh, performance uh, from 1896, and that is that Oedipus gouges out his own eyes. You know, great tragedy is a bloody enterprise um, in uh, acknowledgement of his own fate. So uh, this is a photograph of him tearing at his clothes with blood running down his face. So disability begins and ends the founding narrative, I want to suggest, of Western culture. We find disability, the human variations we think of as disability that shape a human body, also shaping the art and cultural products of any body. So I have some examples here. This is a portrait of John Milton on the left and on the right is the cover, of course, of Milton's Paradise Lost, 
one of the most important poems in all of English, which Milton, of course, writes when he is blind. There are courses and books about Milton and blindness if you are interested in following this. Um, the next slide is a presentation, of course, of Beethoven, one of the most important uh, composers in Western culture, who composes his most important significant symphonies, of course, when he is deaf. And there's much work done on this. So. Milton's blindness and Beethoven's deafness inflect, shape, the artistic and aesthetic products that they produce. And this is a very fundamental principle of disability cultural studies. And I'll give you many more examples. Um, in terms of musical performance, um, I'm showing you here three uh, artists from a very particular genre of artistic production and performance, and that is blind black pianists or um, piano performers. Uh, the first here is from the late 19th century, uh, a autistic uh, artist named that was called, his stage name was Blind Tom Wiggins. Uh, from the 20th century, we have, of course, Ray Charles, and we have Stevie Wonder. I'm showing pictures of all these men who performed what might be called neurodiversity, um, and blindness at the same time in their artistic production. Um, another genre of performance that uh, I've worked on extensively, and that is what are sometimes called the freak shows or the wonder shows, uh, which date from antiquity right up until uh, the first decades of the 20th century. And this is a photograph of the uh, of Charles and Lavinia Stratton. Charles Stratton was known as Tom Thumb, perhaps the most photographed person of the early uh, 20th century, and uh, or certainly of the 19th century. And this is a, a wedding portrait of these small people or uh, little people, which is uh, the term it is sometimes used now. Um, in 1863, photographed by Matthew Brady, the famous photographer, uh, and this wedding was performed by uh, the famous American um, entrepreneur, uh, of course, and that is, um, oh, his, head, his name has fallen out of my head. We all know, I'm sorry. It'll come to me. I was up very late. Um, again, from the American context, one of the most important operas, folk opera, uh, is um, George Gershwin's uh, Porgy and Bess. And I'm showing two images, uh, a 1959 image of the uh, uh, main character, Porgy, who is crippled. He's called the goat cart man. Um, and that's on the left. And then on the right is uh, an updated version of Porgy and Bess from 2011, where we have Porgy moving from being down on his knees in 1959 to being an upright Porgy uh, with a leg brace in 2011. But again, the entire narrative of Porgy and Bess turns on the character of Porgy, who is a so-called crippled a uh, black man um, in uh, in Gershwin's play. Um, there is a, a great deal of good culture, uh, an interesting culture that comes from deaf culture. This is simply one example of a very short film called Can You Read My Lips, which is done by a colleague of mine. It's about a colleague of mine named Rachel Kolb, which is a performance of uh, of uh, sign language and uh, of lip reading at the same time. So I'd highly recommend your finding this delightful uh, video and using it in teaching. Um, in literature, and remember I'm a 
professor of American literature, so I spend time talking about this. The uh, most significant, arguably the most canonical novel of the 19th century American literature is Herman Melville's Moby Dick, which turns on the main character, Captain Ahab, who is an amputee. Uh, in the 20th century, the most canonical novel is William Faulkner's The Sound of the Fury. The protagonist of this novel, of course, is Benji Compson, who is a, um, a person with a neurological difference or uh, a cognitive disability. Some of the more recent uh, work done uh, in uh, American literature and poetry in the broadest sense, I'll give you some examples. This is a book of poetry from 2019 by the uh, deaf poet Ilya Kaminsky called Deaf Republic. I would highly recommend this poetry. Um, Emma mentioned the collection of uh, pieces from the New York Times, uh, which are uh, essays that are written about disability by people who identify as disabled. So this uh, provides actually a good teaching material. Um, I'll talk a little bit about dance now. I'll give you some examples. Um, dance, disability has transformed dance by providing new opportunities for movement vocabularies, vocabularies in a broad range of um, different forms of dance. This is Leroy Moore, who is a poet and a creator of the dance genre that he calls Crip Hop, which of course is a play on the concept or the phrase hip hop. And um, he is a dancer, uh, a black man dancer who has cerebral palsy and whose bodily movements have provided opportunities, as I suggested, for a whole new form of dance. He also works with the performance art collective called Sins Invalid which is a wonderful play on the term invalid and invalid. Uh, some other examples of disability dance. This is Claire Cunningham from the UK, who has incorporated crutches, in this case, what are called uh, arm crutches or Canadian crutches, into her performance as part of the costuming of her dance performance. Um, introducing, again, opportunities for new equipment that go beyond ballet shoes um, and other forms of traditional dance costuming. Um, another genre of disability dance, which I think is quite interesting and important, comes, and this is a recent photograph from 2020, of the dancer Jerron Herman, who is a uh, black disabled dancer. Uh, whose um, left arm is affected by cerebral palsy. And again, this has given him an opportunity to introduce into his dance vocabulary an entire new set of movements that uh, are made available only through the distinctiveness of his own embodiment. So there's a lot of work that you can find um, on the internet. Um, of uh, Jerron Herman and many other disabled dancers performing. So I suggest that you have an opportunity to look at this. Here's one other image of the more common wheelchair dancers. So dancing on wheels as opposed to dancing on legs has again transformed the genre of dance in um, innovative ways. This is uh, a performance from uh, an image of a performance from Kinetic Light wheelchair dancers um, doing new and interesting um, uh, virtuous vir uh, movements of great virtuosity. Um, I particularly appreciate these two dancers. Uh, David Toole is a British dancer who just died recently. He's a legless dancer on the left and Homer Avila, an American dancer, uh, both of them we have now lost, who was a one-legged dancer. And their embodiment has given them the opportunity to do some very interesting floor movements and also to introduce arms into a dance vocabulary of contemporary dance that has been slighted in the past by the dominance of legs um, as um, 
part of the form of embodiment that is understood as essential in contemporary dance. So the idea of a one-legged dancer or a legless dancer, again, has been a really important opportunity. I particularly appreciate this photograph of David Toole, who is if you will, standing. I don't know if this is the right vocabulary, but it's a dominant vocabulary on one arm. Uh, well, the other arm is extending and he has a costume designed for him by the late British designer, Alexandra McQueen, which looks like a fan skirt of some kind that is again, particularly appropriate for someone who is legless. Um, more recently, uh, a very interesting performance, and I actually wrote quite a bit about this myself um, on the 200th anniversary of um, the publication of Frankenstein. There was a lot that was done. Um, Frankenstein, of course, is Mary Shelley's uh, story of uh, outsiderness and difference and monstrosity. And this is a, an image from the uh, London Royal Opera House performance of Frankenstein by Liam Scarlett, which I thought was quite moving uh, and is a very interesting um, opportunity to think about the um, translation of a literary text into a visual text and to think about the challenges of uh, displaying bodily difference in Mary Shelley's creature. Um, in the form of a ballet. So uh, this wasn't performed very much, but you can get a CD of this um, quite easily. So from art and design, I have quite a number of examples about uh, illustrating that disability is everywhere. Here is um, a vase from uh, the classical golden age, uh, or really actually a bit before the golden age of uh, Athenian art. Uh, and we have here on this amphora, uh, the image of a, uh, a little person, someone uh, with short stature or uh, probably dwarfism. So this is a genetic condition, as you well know, uh, that um, has been a, a part of human variation uh, throughout all of Western culture. And of course, Velasquez's La, Las Maninas from 1656 shows again uh, a community of small people. Um, we have uh, people that uh, live under the category of a, a chondroplasia here from 1656, as well as other small people that uh, Velasquez records. And uh, these people, as I'm sure you maybe know, were important, an important part of uh, court culture, European court culture um, in the 17th and, and other centuries. Um, from the 20th century uh, of American art, uh, here is an image from Jacob Lawrence, a very important African-American artist called Blind Beggars, which shows a kind of a cacophony, if you will, of uh, street life um, in uh, New York, in the United States, uh, with uh, blind uh, beggars uh, all dressed up going down the street. Um, of course, Frida Kahlo, the uh, Mexican artist uh, who had multiple disabilities um, and uh, did a number of self interesting self portraits. Um, she's famous for her braces, for her wheelchair, for her costuming, and of course, for her eyebrows. Uh, I want to call attention to some uh, contemporary disabled artists. I've mentioned a number of those. This is, I think, a very important painting, uh, self-portrait that uh, could be used, in my view, in medical education. This is a self-portrait done by the disabled artist, Riva Lehrer, whose primary subjects are leaders in the disability community. And this 2019 portrait uh, shows uh, an image of her back. So it's a self-portrait, not unlike some of Frida Kahlo's self-portraits. And Riva Lehrer was born with the condition uh, called spina bifida, which is one of the conditions that is rather um, 
uh, aggressively tested for in a variety of different kinds of reproductive testing in what I call the obstetric environment and is generally understood as a condition that is, uh, it is compatible with life, but it's understood as a condition that reduces life quality uh, and uh, needs to be eliminated from the human condition in some way. It's a very complicated case study that I would be happy to talk about, but I think a portrait like Riva Lehrer's here needs to enter into the conversation about quality of life and other measurements that we use in uh, medical practice and the development of uh, medical treatment and policy making, of course. So this is Rivalera's self-portrait. And of course, Van Gogh that I pointed out, uh, the portrait of, uh, of him with his bandaged ear from uh, 1889, I wanted to introduce that to you into the genre of self-portraits of people with disabilities because it's a very long, long history and one that is developed and can be developed, I think, quite effectively in art history and makes for very good uh, teaching uh, in what I call the narrative humanities. Uh, in this genre, we also have the late works. So Van Gogh's work is a late work, his self-portrait, but uh, certainly Monet's uh, late work, uh, this picture of the water lilies, Claude Monet does this, um, from 1940, uh, 1914 to 1926. And of course, in many late works of artists, they have come into disability as Monet did. The older he got, the more blind he became, the more blind he became, the more impressionistic, what we would think of maybe as fuzzy or out of focus, his artwork actually became. And that was understood not as a compensation, but as a uh, development of his artistic practice that was made possible through the changes in his vision. So once again, we have the imprint of the body on the artistic production of an artist, in particular in um, the genre of people's late works. Beethoven is the same. Uh, this is the important American artist, Judith Scott. In a photograph, Judith Scott um, died recently. She is a, was uh, a woman uh, born with uh, Down syndrome. Uh, she was non-speaking, diagnosed with autism, uh, and she uh, began fiber wrapping uh, when she was working in an arts uh, day center in Berkeley, California. Uh, and she wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and uh, has uh, come to be recognized as one of the most important uh, sculptors of the 20th century. So um, her work, I think, is really important to look at. And of course, what was, I think what's wonderful is that she never commented ever about her work. She just kept doing it and doing it. Um, this is a work by a disabled artist, uh, and I'll show you another thing a little bit later that I think is really promising. This is Catherine Sherwood, who is a painter uh, who became disabled uh, about 25 years ago by having a stroke that paralyzed the right side of her body, as apparently strokes do, and she was a right-handed artist. And as a result of this opportunity, she uh, taught her left arm to do art. And she also incorporated uh, into her art, uh, as a result of this stroke, the image uh, of her x-rays, so the brain imagery of her own brain, uh, into all of her artwork. So what she's doing in this photograph called Olympia, of course, uh, is that she is taking established traditions, that is to say, in this case, the odalesques uh, of, I think it's Manet, I hope I've got that right, and she is inflecting those art forms with uh, her own experience and perspective, so she has substituted 
the face uh, of Olympia with the x-ray of her own brain, and she has put a leg brace on this particular Olympia. So this entire series, these Venuses, are uh, very interesting. I would encourage you to look at Catherine Sherwood's work. She's a very successful artist, again, whose art has been transformed through disability as an aesthetic opportunity. Uh, this is another one, uh, one of uh, her more recent pieces uh, in which she is um, replicating a number of Madonnas. And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, uh, portrait or this uh, artistic um, genre using illusion, that is to say, uh, taking well-known photograph, uh, well-known pieces of art and inflecting them with new meaning. Uh, and Catherine Sherwood has done this, I think, quite successfully. This is an image that's a little bit hard to read. I'm sorry it isn't large enough, but it's a very recent piece. And so I, I only have this in which she is taking a very well-known genre, and that is a Madonna, and has uh, substituted, if you will, uh, the face of uh, for both uh, the Madonna, that is to say the Mother of God or Mary, depending on how we want to talk about this uh, figure, very recognizable figure, and of course the Christ child and has put um, these uh, images, uh, brain imagery from her own um, medical record. So I'll talk a little bit also about accessible um, and inclusive design, which is another genre uh, that is really important in making things in the world um, that uh, both accommodate and reflect the predominance of disability in the human population. So prosthetics, of course, uh, were previously and I can talk a little bit more about this if you're interested in the history of prosthetics and how it entwines with the history of disability rights and inclusion. Uh, prosthetics were designed, of course, to be hidden in the past, but now prosthetics are often designed to be viewed. They're, off, they're a part in some ways of disability pride, if you will. Uh, these are some prosthetics which are aesthetic prosthetics designed to be looked at rather than designed to be hidden. This is from the Alternative Limb Project. This is a full uh, leg prosthetic that is um, encrusted, uh, very often these are encrusted with jewels and with beautiful, uh, in this case, uh, ornate uh, pictures of flowers and vines. Um, this is Hugh Hare, who is a engineer and a designer of prosthetic legs. He himself is a double amputee. And this is a wonderful, I think, picture of him in a, a very uh, mid-century modern chair with his mid-century modern legs. His double prosthetic legs designed for mountain climbing and of course for walking and climbing stairs. This is Kathy D. Woods, who is a woman of small stature, a little person, an African-American woman, who is a pioneer of disability fashion because she designs clothes for adults that are small people and other people with disabilities. So these kinds of sartorial inflections, if you will, um, have allowed people with disabilities to come out of the uh, medical sphere and into the employment sphere and to the professional world because they are able to dress appropriately for um, different kinds of professional uh, jobs, which is really very important. And wheelchairs, of course, are in some ways the major sign of this. Wheelchairs, of course, were designed originally as medical devices, and now they are sport devices as well as uh, devices that are widely used by a number of people in order to be out and about in a newly accessible world. Uh, people really like this image of a tactile watch, uh, which is a watch, of course, that can uh, be touched in order to tell the time. So there's a uh, there are tactile elements, the numbers or the points on the watch, as well as the hands supposedly on the watch here can be felt. Uh, haptically, uh, rather than uh, be um, uh, looked at visually. 
This is uh, perhaps the best example of the transformation of the built and designed environment to uh, be more inclusive uh, for people with disabilities. So as I'm sure you well know, the history of the ramp as a transformational design object began in the 1960s with uh, laws and policies that uh, required uh, public spaces and private spaces later to be made accessible to people with disabilities. And the ramp, of course, is the iconic design implement for this. And when ramps were originally designed and used in buildings, they were often thought to uh, be aesthetic blights to ruin the aesthetic value of a building because they were ugly and they were made of aluminum and they were fastened on to the front of a building. But um, over the many years, almost 50 years now of uh, designing for disability, uh, ramps have moved from the front doors of buildings for the most part uh, into the very center of the building in terms of design and of course in terms of meaning. So this is a building in Berkeley, California and there's a, a beautiful ramp that is designed to be used and it is designed to be seen and it is designed to be the central uh, aesthetic feature of this building. It's a red ramp, uh, much like the ramp, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, if you've been there. But of course, this is a ramp that is much more usable. And I think it expresses this um, entry into the world of a whole segment of the human population, uh, the largest minority group, if you will, to use that language, uh, certainly in the United States, but in the world, it's estimated that 10% of the world's population are people with disabilities. Um, and that this expresses the inclusion of people with disabilities. And I don't want to be overly optimistic and to suggest that uh, the segregation of people with disabilities has been eliminated, but rather disability design and the policies and the practices of desegregation and inclusion uh, in a variety of different formats and genres, uh, this kind of technologies has given us a way to understand disability desegregation, disability inclusion, has given us a metaphor, if you will, for bringing a previously excluded group of people more into the public sphere and to also give us a suggestion for how we might understand disability uh, not as a pathological condition, but rather as a social and political community that has been constituted by a variety of laws and policies and practices, beginning with the civil and human rights movement of the early 20th century. I very often show, and I don't think I am showing here, I'm sorry to say, a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt holding the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which begins on a worldwide scale, a variety of different inclusive policies and practices and what I call covenants aimed at making people with disabilities, creating a community of people with disabilities that are a protected category, legal category. So they bring disability, all of this language brings disability out of the hospital, out of the clinic, and into the public world. So I'm showing you these symbols, international symbols of access, which of course express that entire movement, that transformation, that constituting of a group a protected category of people with rights and obligations worldwide. Um, and this is the older from 1968 
uh, symbol of uh, access, the international symbol of access, which is a somewhat static stick figure, blue and white, uh, of a wheelchair user. And the more recent icon, which I think is very interesting and, of course, is controversial from 2010, the more dynamic uh, image of the wheelchair user leaning forward and um, expressing the idea of self-mobility uh, in this image, uh, which I think shows a kind of transformation in how we imagine the agency of people with disabilities in the world. And I'd be happy to talk more about that, um, if you will. I wanted also, uh, and I'm going to struggle with this, uh, to show you something rather new in terms of the designed environment. And this is a dementia village which is in, uh, it's called De Hogewak, am I, how am I doing? Pretty, okay, anyway. It's in Vesp in the Netherlands, and it's a village designed for people with dementia to live in effectively. Um, and you can go and look more fully at what kind of designed elements uh, are in this village uh, and how this village has been put together so that people with dementia can live successfully or effectively in this village uh, and safely in the village. And I don't know very much about it yet, but um, I think it's, it's a very interesting and promising idea in terms of urban design. Um, I want to end with uh, some of the work that I've been doing very briefly and show you again one of Catherine Sherwood's images. But I want to make the claim that finding disability, which I hope I have helped you to do somewhat in this uh, uh, presentation, is an opportunity, I've stressed this, uh, to explore and to redefine and to make new stories about what it means to be human. So I want to suggest by universalizing disability to a certain degree to all humanity, that this is a very productive way to understand our essential being as enfleshed humans. <laughs> Merleau-Ponty this and Merleau-Ponty that. I thought that was the best line I've heard in months. Uh, enfleshed humanity. Um, and that this is a universal condition rather than a condition to be eliminated. So in that uh, spirit, I have advanced what I call the case for conserving disability, and I want to offer some language. This is more words than ought to be on any slide, and I apologize for that, but you can think about it later if it is of interest to you. And that is, I've made what I call a case for conserving disability, what it is we want instead of what it is that we might be against. And I want to suggest that a conservationist ethics would focus on creating a supportive material context, what I want to call a moral ecosystem in which human embodied existence can successfully thrive as it is. So that would be my principle, number one, of what a conservationist disability ethics might be. The second, point that I want to make in my case for conserving disability rather than eliminating it from the world as a eugenic undertaking is that a conservationist ethics aims to strengthen the cultural, political, and institutional climate in which people with disabilities, oh, that should say can rather than and, most effectively flourish. I should say as a side note that the reason that says an instead of can is that I use uh, talk to text <laughs> to compose and it makes these often charming little mistakes 
Uh, and there are a whole bunch of them that I could share with you uh, if you're interested, but they're very hard to pick up and, and I missed that one here, so apologies for that. But I would encourage all of you uh, who are people with words in your fingers to become people with words in your mouths because our machines will uh, will hurt us as they always do. Uh, they will always injure us and it's a good idea for us to always learn how to have words in our mouths when um, the words that are in our fingers are no longer accessible to us through repetitive stress injuries and the various um, damages to our bodies that um, living in the world brings. So just a few images uh, to end this with, um, and that is this project that I'm undertaking just now, uh, in which I um, am thinking about public art and public imagery and what kind of didactic work it does. In other words, how public art uh, has the capacity to teach us uh, and that, of course, is the point of public didactic art. And one of the most pervasive genres, of course, of public art is Christian art uh, from the um, uh, primarily European artistic tradition of the last several thousand years, but certainly from the Renaissance or the early modern period, if you will, forward. And um, I've been uh, thinking about the image of the Pieta, which of course is a very iconic image. We could almost say it's a meme, if you will, in its uh, its readability. It's very recognizable to us. And I'm showing here the image of Michelangelo's Pieta, which of course is in St. Peter's uh, in the Vatican. And I want to suggest that this, which is usually understood as an image of lament, is instead a commentary on human vulnerability and the need for care ethics and uh, mutual interdependency. Um, and since it's a very um, recognizable image uh, of what I call human care or body care, I want to reread this in the context of the replications or the allusions to uh, this particular choreography of embodiment that is so recognizable and to think about what kind of moral work it might do in the world. And so I'm going to share with you just a few of the many, 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 many other pietas uh, of, in this case, the 20th century or 21st century. Uh, and this is one that I think is extraordinarily beautiful. It's a piece called Still Life or Pieta done in 2007 by Sam Jinks, who is an Australian. I hope I've got that right and not New Zealand, but I'm going to say Australian. Pardon me, Sam, if I have it wrong. Uh, sculpture artist uh, who works in the genre of realism uh, in which uh, Jinx has taken this choreography of embodiment that is so familiar to the classical, uh, to the Western eye, if you will, and has re-scripted uh, the scene uh, to uh, make us ask new questions and think new things. So instead of having the mother of God holding on her lap the body of her dead son, we have a man, a kind of ordinary man in the gray flannel suit, if you will, um, who is contemplating, perhaps not lamenting, but contemplating a figure holding in a care position on his lap, um, an old person uh, who is again uh, naked and exposed, who could be alive, who could be dead. It's not clear what the relationship is between these two figures, uh, but it asks us questions by invoking this very familiar bodily choreography of care. Uh, new questions about care and about human relationships uh, and about human embodiment and dependency. So um, there is, I have many of these images, of course. Um, and this is another that I'll offer you from 2018, 
uh, Tylon Sawyer's Pieta, which again takes this familiar choreography of holding, of mutuality, if you will, of care, and puts it in another context. It's very much an American context. So we have in the background of this Pieta, the American flag, to point out, of course, the irony of the continuing racism in the United States. So the mother of God here becomes uh, another mother, maybe, and instead of this mother, instead of the mother of God looking down in lament at her dead son, we have this mother looking straight out at the audience in a visual posture of accusation and holding on her lap. She has, she has white robes as if, you know, from the Greek tradition, of course, uh, and from the classical Greek and Roman tradition of, of sculpture. And holding on her lap, she has a boy, we think, but uh, a child who also appears to be um, a black boy or at least a, a person of color, if you will, um, and who appears to have the uh, costuming that is so common in... Um, American uh, sartorial life now, and that is a hoodie. Uh, and she's holding this boy on her lap uh, in a very different uh, visual iconography uh, of care and accusation at the same time. So there is a very different message in this Pieta than we see, for example, in uh, the Pieta in the Vatican. But this is still the same, uh, as I said, visual choreography, the same didactic purpose can be offered up here in uh, this kind of work. And I have many others um, that you can find in other places that we can talk about. And you can find more Pietas and send them to me, and I would be grateful. So thank you very much. Our time, Emma, help me. Yes, we still have plenty. That's a thing. Oh, it's a miracle. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I will stay here so I can use the uh, microphone and shout, which and I, I do will all day around. long. Yeah. And I will walk around. With yes, you. and again, we don't have to have questions here. Just I comments. Uh, I would be very interested in knowing more about the works and projects that you have today and how they might fit into this larger enterprise of cultural disability studies. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question um, concerning uh, literary, studied, uh, literary studies. Um, you talked mostly about the representations of visible disability. And I was wondering, can you say a little bit more about representations of uh, invisible or cognitive uh, disabilities because uh, I am working in literary studies myself and I've noticed um, that there has been a bit of a, a, bit of a backlash against uh, the practice of yeah, diagnosing fictional characters. Um, exactly. And so I was wondering how you would respond to that. And then a second question, if I may, um, there is uh, this question, or you, you mentioned um, artists um, whose disability um, reflects in their art or who, whose disability has uh, enabled them to uh, perform their art. Um, so how would you go about this in literary studies where there is always this strict division between a biographical author uh, and their work and people are quite adamant to keep that division um, there? Thanks. Well, people are adamant about everything, so you can just dismiss all that and do what you want. <laughs> um, I think the most, at, at least for me, the most productive concept um, to bring forward here is the question of legibility in social relations. So I mentioned that, uh, of course, many of you, I'm sure, know that there's... Um, 
uh, a great deal of work done uh, in disability studies about what we call the social model and the medical model and the moral model. Um, and what these models, uh, and this comes largely from the field of sociology, uh, do is to try to take um, the human variations that we think of as disability out of the an interpretive framework of scientific medicine and to put those uh, human variations into an interpretive framework using sociology and a variety of other, uh, if you will, knowledge tools. And so uh, what that does, of course, is that uh, it works against a centralizing disability, uh, but it has certain limitations as, as every kind of interpretive framework has. Um, and I think it's most promising to think about legibility and recognition in social relations. So what that would mean is that we would move away from thinking about um, physical and cognitive disabilities, but rather think about, uh, I offered the term body-mind differences. I think that's a very useful uh, and somewhat legible uh, phrase, but also uh, it contributes to depathologizing disability. So I'm saying a lot here. Um, and it also, I think, helps us uh, think about the limitations of the dichotomy that we use a lot, and that is between visible and invisible disabilities. I want us to think about legibility and to think about recognition. So in terms of representation, um, in narrative, um, it's conventionally, it's um, more recognizable to narrate a character's, what we think of as physical disabilities, um, also in representation. Uh, there are uh, challenges to represent uh, what we think of as neurodiversity in, in representation. Now, how do we show that where we're able to <clears throat> represent, uh, say, physical disabilities uh, much more easily? You can take a character, whether you're taking a picture of it or writing a story about it, and give it a crutch or a wheelchair, and you suddenly have a, a lot of legibility. There's a lot to be recognized in terms of of uh, representation and uh, representational technologies, if you will. So I think that um, two things. One is all of the human variations that we think of as disabilities take on social and moral meaning when they are recognized in the world in human relationships. So that's why I think body-mind differences is a good way to talk about this and that there are no disabilities that are technically invisible because they become, those differences become recognizable in some way. For example, if someone has a, what we might call a seizure disorder, that might be completely unrecognizable in some so circumstances or in some representational narratives, uh, but it becomes significant when it manifests itself in something like a, like a seizure, a seizure. And so the social meaning of these differences um, is always in the, the realm of the recognizable, which is often visual. I hope that wasn't too much. Now, the retrospective diagnosis business, I think we ought to get out of the business of that. Um, there's, there's a huge 
set of uh, work in, uh, in medicine, in medical humanities, as well as in literary studies that goes something like, what did Emily Dickinson really have? Uh, or what did Van Gogh really have? What was the medical diagnosis? These are profoundly ahistorical because every medical diagnosis, every pathological narrative is historical. It changes over time. Schizophrenia is a particularly important uh, case study in this respect. Um, the people who were euthanized uh, by the Nazis were uh, over 90% of the medical records of those people that were euthanized in the T4 program uh, had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Uh, now, that appears, when we look at this historically, to be a, a, a big bag that the Nazis could use on a medical record to justify their euthanasia program. In the 1950s, schizophrenia was understood as a, uh, as a, a disease of, uh, black un of the black male underclass in America. And now schizophrenia tends more to be understood as a disease of white um, underemployed women. So we know that's just one case study of how any of these diagnostic narratives change over time. And one of the most important, uh, I think, contributions that the narrative humanities can make is to historicize uh, all of these diagnostic categories. Medicine is not very good at history. Uh, and um, bioethics isn't either. So uh, this is one contribution that I think what I call the narrative humanities, and I do that to kind of take philosophy and Merleau-Ponty and put it a little bit over here, because the uh, methods of philosophy are generally not historical or narrative. They tend to be, um, they have their own sets of methods and assumptions. Okay, thank you, that was very helpful. Thank you. Long, I'm sure. Was disability conservation list the term you used before? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Um, let me just ask my question. As a disability conservationist, I hope that is the right term. Um, how Thank do you, look you, that's a great term. Okay, sure. How do you look upon ideas of transhumanism? The idea of bioconservatism, which is uh, a controversial term, but it's the it's one that I actually want to embrace and was suggesting. Uh, by using the idea of conservation, I'm invoking, of course, um, the ethics of um, biodiversity conservation, which is applied quite liberally, quite literally, to uh, the world of animals and plants and, um, and uh, anthropological communities, but is almost never applied to humans. Uh, we we want to preserve rare species uh, of frogs and plants, uh, but there's very little interest in preserving rare species of human beings, uh, such as people with Down syndrome, which are an endangered species if we want to use this uh, analogy. And so that's why I wanted to use the term conservation. Um, but of course, to conserve, and conservative in general um, suggests a gesture toward what is and what was rather than a gesture toward futurity. I have become very suspicious of futurity um, in what might be called the eugenic present uh, because the premise of uh, a eugenic future, 
And of course, that's not really the word that's used now because the word eugenics, which was science was eugenics and eugenics was science until basically 1946 when um, the whole set of assumptions of eugenics and the term itself was uh, questioned uh, at the Nuremberg doctor's trial where uh, Karl Brandt, who was Hitler's personal physician, was convicted and later executed. Um, and from, this is my uh, history of bioethics, and, and from that questioning that medical science uh, really put forward at the Nuremberg doctor's trial came a whole apparatus that we think of as uh, as bioethics. And it is a conservative rather than a futuristic enterprise, at least it should be in my view, uh, because um, we cannot predict the actions of the present um, in terms of their future effects very effectively. And um, my own belief is that the stakes are very high when we think we are doing things to improve humanity and we simply need to be careful. The transhumanists, uh, and of course that's a big bag of people, um, have a very different approach. They tend to be philosophically utilitarians. Um, the example that gets trotted out all the time, of course, is Peter Singer, uh, the philosopher, uh, the Australian philosopher, who uh, is maybe the most well-known, famous philosopher of our age, uh, who um, on the one hand, uh, has advanced, uh, if you will, an ethical um, program with uh, what he's done, his contribution to to animal studies. I'm trying to be very careful here. Uh, he's a utilitarian, of course, and um, but at the expense of questioning the border between animals and people, uh, which was an, a very important thing to do, to ask questions uh, about our treatment of animals, he has inexplicably to me, but you know, he's a philosopher. So once a philosopher says something, they're like a dog with a bone. Um, they tend to be reluctant to go back on it. Um, and of course, he made a, I think, a, a, a bad philosophical argument by uh, basically saying that um, parents ought to be able to euthanize their disabled newborns if they don't want them. But it's, it was more a provocation than a point. And, but from that, from that logic, which is in some ways the logic of autonomy and consent, um, comes a whole, a justification for a whole set of, in my view, eugenic practices uh, that we really should examine. Um, and so some of Singer's fellow um, uh, transhumanists, like the philosopher Julian Savalescu, who has a whole center at Oxford, have put forward concepts like procreative beneficence, which say that uh, parents should be able to choose the traits of, of their children that they think are best. And, you know, ethically, when you start talking about what's best or what advantages are, and this is really everything I'm doing, and they're not predictable. We, we can't say with any assurance what characteristics or what qualities are going to be benefits or advantages 
in future generations. Uh, and so that's why I think um, being much more conservative uh, in bioethics, not in politics necessarily, but in bioethics um, is a, a good position uh, when it comes to disability justice and other forms of justice. It's a long answer. What do you think of transhumanists? Are you asking me? Um, I think there is, um, I think there's a difference between um, prescribed transhumanism, as in the world, everybody should be transhumanist, and as in individual choices. And personally, I emphasize individual choice, whereas I think any ideology that um, has a strong opinion of what the world should be like and what people should be like that isn't conserving those who already exist, I think that is very problematic. Yeah, yeah there's a, a huge literature, I'm sure many of us are aware of it, uh, that is, I call it the critique of uh, possessive individual, well, not I call it, it can be called the critique of possessive individualism that uh, points out uh, that um, individualism itself uh, has limitations, modern individualism, upon which, of course, the, you know, the, the subject of liberal democratic orders is founded. Um, and those limits, the limits of autonomy, the limits of consent itself, um, we need to examine. And there, feminism has done this, of course, and uh, as I suggested, care ethics has also done that. Vulnerability theory, there, there's really a lot of good conversation about um, the place of individualism. The thing I think is uh, very useful about working in bioethics, and I'm only new to this, I just finished a master's degree in bioethics and I think I must be the oldest human being to ever graduate from this particular program because it took forever once the pandemic took place to finish it. But Bioethics, I think, um, is needs to. It's it's an applied field um, at, rather than a theoretical field. In the end, uh, policy and practice is is informed by bioethics. Action action needs to be taken, and and I think it's important for us to look. Uh, very carefully uh, and to talk in complicated ways about what harms and what benefits any particular medical or scientific medical technology or treatment or practice uh, gives us. So it's, it's a very fraught uh, but interesting and important field. It's a long answer. And a fascinating one. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, there was a question online in the chat, so I will just read it to you. So um, Farah asks, do you think that the framework of the feminist disability studies is useful and could be explored and used more by the neurodiversity movement? And then they give the example of considering the inclusion of autistic women. Thank you in advance, she said. Um, yes. Uh Certainly, uh, as I suggested, in the broadest sense, what we think of as feminism has introduced uh, some very important work, but also some very important uh, concepts. Uh, for example, um, I mentioned care ethics, which is uh, founded on the, as I mentioned, the critique of uh, possessive individualism and care ethics suggests that there is uh, value in thinking about relations of dependency rather than the individual independent subject of liberal democratic orders, um, and that care work, of course, has uh, traditionally really almost throughout all of uh, at least Western history been assigned to women. 
So there are, I think there's some really good work done in care ethics, in uh, questioning dependency. We, we can look at, um, I, I think the work of Eva Kate is very important in this work and Jackie Leach Scully has done good work. I mean, lots of people have done this. Uh, so by looking at the traditional roles uh, of women, we can learn a lot about um, what it means to be human and what it means to have a body since all of that work has generally been assigned to women throughout most of culture. So that's a little bit of a long answer, but um, I think that's quite promising. Um, yeah, so I really appreciated the overview you gave of all these uh, more emancipatory uh, representations of disability, I think, and their meanings um, and the re-readings you presented. Um, but in practice, most cultural representations of disability are, I think, a bit more negative and you know a lot more about this. But for example, in video games, um, disability <laughs> and monstrosity is still something that's very often connected. Um, monstrosity? Is yeah, that yeah. Um, or, for example, a disability being represented as something to overcome. Uh, and my question then would be, um, what can we do with these representations beyond criticizing them? Because, like you pointed out, in light of the conversationist uh, ethics, um, if we only criticize them, it's, this runs the risk of, uh, again, excluding uh, disability from the conversation. So that would be my question. Yes, I, it's very intentional that I um, have been, I, I've been starting to write something which I think is clever called a manifesto against against, um, <clears throat> in which I, I want to suggest that um, instead of not instead of, but that we move away from uh, the uh, skeptical disposition that post-structuralism gave us, and I'm being very general here, and move toward what, uh, I, I like the term that the American literary critic Eve Sedgwick used when she talks about reparative narratives. Um, and I want to think about what reparative narratives we might have uh, because I think that we want to work more toward what we're for than what we're against. Uh, as, a, as a bit of a corrective uh, in, you know, if you imagine what we think of sometimes as a Hegelian movement in critical theory, we, you know, we're, there was the time when essentialism was what we wanted to banish. And then when that got good and banished, uh, then we needed to revive uh, the role of the body. And so I think it's important to think about uh, how to make people in general, all of us, feel like we have um, livable lives and meaningful work to do. And so I think skepticism and critique can sometimes undercut that. Okay, thank you. I can pass on the mic if someone has a question. Thanks for your lecture. Also enjoyed it. Uh, and maybe want to follow up on your suggestion to use the term uh, conservationist ethics. Um, and I think what I want to yeah, express is maybe a bit of uh, personal doubts about this term. Uh, because to me, it sounds, uh, uh, or at least the more affirmative part, I could really uh, agree with that uh, disability ethics should also focus a lot on, uh, on fostering the social and political environments where people can flourish irrespective of their bodies. Um, but at the same time, I, I felt that it was um, maybe kind of built on on a, on a classical social model approach to, to disability, where we are cons conservationists about the, the actual bodily impairments, and that's what the only thing that we're able and, and willing to change 
is the social environment around it. And I think especially in the neuroepigenetics project we've, we've been doing and talking a lot about is about this, uh, how this distinction doesn't really hold and that uh, also our bodies and also uh, our disabled body, bodies and minds are actually always uh, not static, but also uh, evolving and developing when we when we grow older, but also that this social and political environment, uh, yeah, it gets under the skin. Um, and so even when we change our social and political environments, it also changes uh, how disability expresses itself. And so this sense, it seems a bit, yeah, I have a bit difficulties in using this term conservationist ethics because it kind of, um, kind of assumes that what, what the disability consists of uh, is something static, which I think it isn't. And yeah, so it's obviously a comment and not a question, but maybe you want to reflect on this. No, you're exactly right. Um, as I suggested, I wanted to use the logic of biodiversity conservation because it's, Frankly, the logic of biodiversity conservation is very easy to embrace. Um, when you're thinking about trees and wetlands and frogs, um, but it's much more difficult to think about conserving uh, human forms that um, are subject to harm that are more vulnerable, maybe, than uh, what I've called normates. So I want to offer a, a, a very soft construct constructivism to get us a little bit out of uh, the extreme essentialism of the biomedical view, of the pathological view of disability, and to put in perspective uh, the often unexamined assumptions uh, that certainly medical scientific practice, but in a way, even political practice, certainly, and certainly public policy has, um, so it becomes, it becomes difficult to, um, to try to put together a way of talking about disability or these human variations that have been named disability by the politics of liberal societies. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a category that's been constituted. Um, and so I wanted to use the word sustaining because of course, again, sustainability is something that is very, in my view, easy to support. Environmentalism, sustainability, these kinds of enterprises, uh, which are, I think, more clearly um, positive enterprises that benefit humanity. I mean, there's all sorts of arguments against them, but they're usually practical arguments. Um, and so that's why I wanted to simply use those words. And I know that there are limitations about it. And especially because although I want to say to someone like Peter Singer, uh, and I'm just using him as an example, uh, you know, that the way transhumanists might want to talk about the future, about the new eugenics about effective altruism. There's also a pro, uh, procreative beneficence. I mean, there's a whole set of words that come out of, in the very broadest sense, transhumanism that um, have premises behind them that I think are profoundly uh, threatening to um, huge swaths of the human population. And so that's, 
that's why I want to try to go in that direction. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have a reception now. We can eat and drink. No, not yet. Not yet. But we still, I still have to say something, I guess. 